gracious and loving God, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you today. Thank you for the food that we're about to receive after the service, and just thank you for this chance to come together. Thank you for a chance to come in from the cold and to fellowship and worship you. We ask that you make your presence known in this service and fill each of our hearts with your love and your grace and mercy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys can stand and worship with us this morning.
And I'm going to invite those who are joining with us uh, today, our new members, if y'all will come forward at this time. And Catherine's going to introduce everybody to y'all. All righty. I am so excited. I'm sure you know these guys, but we're going to officially introduce them. So over here we have Tom and Johnette Sherwood, and they are coming to us from Eastbrook Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> So Tom and Johnette have jumped right in. They have helped with us at Fortson on, uh, during the summer, and they are going to help coordinate our tutoring program at Fortson starting in January. So we were very thankful for that and very excited that they have just jumped in with both feet. Um, on, and on this side, we have Nick, Nicole, and Noel Kulik. They are coming to us from Bethesda United Methodist in Easley. <laughs> So Nick and Nicole will be joining today, and Noel will be one of our preparatory members, meaning as soon as she is completed with confirmation in a year or two, she will be a full member as well. Uh, these guys have also jumped in with both feet, and we are just very excited. They've joined us on our Wednesday night life groups. They've been coming to Wednesday night dinners, and um, at both, group, both couples and, and families have joined us for the Bible studies. So we are very excited to have you guys as well. All right, so now I get to ask questions, so I'm, I feel like I'm like a tennis match or something here, <laughs> back and forth. So um, obviously they have uh, been baptized and professed their faith, confirmed their faith, um, coming from, a, again, a, a different denomination and from the United Methodist Church. Uh, so we only have two questions that we ask, and I'll it really two for you and one for you, but I'm going to ask them both to, to all of you, okay? And, and that is, uh, will, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church at this point in time in your life and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? All right. And will you support this local congregation here, Trinity United Methodist Church of Anderson, with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? All right. Yay. And I have a question for y'all as well. Because as they come to us into this body of Christ, we have an obligation. We have a duty. We have a responsibility. So I'm going to ask y'all if you will support these families. Surround them with your love, with your care, so that they may be strengthened in their faith. If so, will you say, with God's help, we will. <laughs> y'all gather around. I'm going to have a prayer over these guys. And uh, so thankful that you are part. And I know that after the service, you're going to want to welcome them and, and give them a hug and all that good stuff. Catherine, come on in here. God, I am so thankful. Thankful for this group of folks. Thankful for Tom, for Johnette, for Nicole, for Nick, for Noel. We pray your blessings to be upon them. We give thanks for the gifts and graces that they bring to us. And we pray, oh God, that we can pour into them so that indeed they grow closer to you and closer to one another. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hi, good morning. You don't want to talk? You don't have to talk. So out there on the tables for the breakfast, we've got some little placemats and there are some little leaves. And I would like you guys and even the big kids, you can't break a leaf, they're paper, um, to write something you are thankful for, something today at our harvest that you have seen God grow in the last year. And if you'll just write the word or a couple words on them and put them in the pails, we're going to do something fun with the kids with those um, when we meet again next Sunday. <clears throat> So today I have a folk tale to tell you. Do you know what a folk tale is? Yes. What's a folk tale? Um, it's where you tell a tale from folks. You tell a tale from folks, and it usually has um, a message in it. So although you may figure something out in the middle, don't shout anything out until I'm done with the story this morning, just so that everybody's at the same pace. Can you do that for me, Joshua? Yes. And Noel, it is very bright. So... You don't even know what story I'm going to tell. <laughs> well, we will see. So there was a king who was traveling with some of his men, 
and their wagon broke. The one of the wheels came off. So while they were fixing the wagon, they got very hot and very thirsty. They were out on this farm road, and there were some little houses here and there. And one of the ladies that was out working in her little garden area saw them and brought some water out so that they wouldn't be so thirsty. And the king thought, ooh, she's cute. You ever seen anybody and thought, oh, when you've seen them? Like a puppy, oh, they're cute, right? He got a little warm and fuzzy. And he was like, she's very kind because she gave us water. So he went home after they fixed the wagon. He got back to his house, the castle, and started thinking about her. And he thought, you know what? She might make me a good wife. But I probably should get to know a little more about her. So he asked one of his men if he would go back to that farm lady who helped them out and, and gave them water and bring this jar. And he said, I want to ask her a question to challenge her. I want to know what she's made of. Ask her if she can put a pumpkin in this jar without breaking the glass or cutting up the pumpkin. And you know this story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the man took the jar and went to the lady and he said, the king has a question for you. He thinks you might make a great wife, but he wanted to know a little more about you and he wanted to know if you're a problem solver. So he has this jar and he wants to know if you can put a pumpkin in here. Now, how big is the hole? I brought a pumpkin as a sample here. Is it going to go in the top? Can it go in the bottom? Not without breaking the jar, right? Could I, if I cut it up or mush it up, it would go in the jar, wouldn't it? But he said, no, you can't cut it. So she looked at the jar, and she was pretty smart. And she said, tell him, it's going to take me a little while to figure this out, but I'll bring it when it's ready. A couple weeks go by, and she shows up at the castle with a pumpkin in a jar. She had taken one of the vines where the pumpkin had started to grow, slid it through the hole, and let it grow inside the jar. And when it was big enough, she cut the stem and took it to the king. The king realized she's not only cute and she's kind, but she's a problem solver and she's patient. I know it's little. And she's patient because what did she have to do to grow the pumpkin? She had to wait. It didn't take that long. Actually, pumpkins grow, pretty, the squash grow fairly quickly. I was amazed when we had one, how quickly they go from the little size to the big size. But would you have thought to do that? Yeah, you think so? Well, she was pretty smart too, and she said, but now, King, I have a question for you. Can you get the pumpkin out without breaking the jar and without cutting the pumpkin? And you know he did? I'll tell you how later. I know, I know, I know, I know. <clears throat> so here's the thing. We can't put a pumpkin in this glass jar. I cannot take that pumpkin and put it in here without breaking the jar and without squishing the pumpkin. But there's nothing God can't do. The problem is sometimes we want to put that pumpkin in this jar right this minute. We have to wait. Today is Harvest Sunday, and we waited through COVID, through some craziness, through issues at home, through stuff at work. We waited to see what God was going to grow. And do you know what he grew? Look out, look out there. Look and see what he grew. He grew five new members <laughs> over the last couple of months. He grew our hearts. He grew our minds. That's the relationships are right out there, Joshua. You're absolutely right. So I want you guys, while you're out there, to find a leaf and put something you're grateful for. Something that you have seen God grow in a way that, yes, in a way that you would not necessarily have thought possible. Can you guys do that this morning? And I'm going to give you a little booklet to play on, to color on, and, and do little activities while you're waiting. And then we'll have some stuff out there for you, too, before we eat. Stop talking about that. All right, we're going to say a quick prayer. Yes? Do you want to pray for us this morning, Joshua? No. Anybody else? No? I'll do it. Is that okay? <laughs> Father God, thank you for creating incredible ways to show how much you care about us. Remind us that sometimes we just have to wait, that your timing is the best timing, and you will show us things we cannot accomplish on our own. Thank you for our church gathered here, for our new members, for our sweet kids that are here. Thank you for the families as they gather around their tables this week coming and for those who don't have a table to gather around. We ask that you be in their presence, whether they are in a home, whether they are in an apartment, whether they are in the hospital. Let them know that they are loved and they are your children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take one and head back. Thank you, Joshua. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. 
We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been that has been given in among the churches of Macedonia for the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this... Not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that he had started so that he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in your love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnest of others that you love that your love is also genuine. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through, though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment, this benefit to you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that, you may, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your c- completing it out of what you have. This is the word of God. As we go to God in prayer this morning, how many of you have something that you are thankful for? Yeah. We certainly don't want to forget our blessings at this time of year or any time of year. And we know that there's many prayer requests and concerns as well. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, Lord of the harvest, you've planted us where you've wanted us to be. You've grown us in the ways that you've wanted us to grow. You use us in ways according to your will. We pray that you will continue to do so for each of us. We thank you for our blessings. We ask you for your forgiveness when we focus more on them and less on you. We thank you for our families, for our extended family, for our church family. We thank you for your kingdom here on earth. We thank you for the opportunities to serve you and reach out to others in ways that touch them with your love and your mercy and your grace. We praise you for all that you have given us, all that you have provided through your son, Not material things, but the things that fill us in our hearts with love and fill us to overflowing. We thank you for the journey that you've brought each of us on and the journey that you will continue to lead us on. We know, Lord, that in this world, we do have many blessings, more than many people. There are still those that are struggling with life, different circumstances, hunger, homelessness, loss of loved ones, those who are victims of violence, not of their own choosing, those who are caught in the midst of war, those who do not have heat during the cold. We have it relatively easy compared to many. And yet, we don't want to discount any of the needs that we have, for we know that you have the knowledge of all that is going on within each of us, within each person in this world, and that you can do something about it. We pray, Lord, that you will use us where you will so that we can fulfill the promises that you have given us in ways that are meaningful to one another and to those beyond. Thank you for all that you have given us again. May we share all that we have with others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
scripture today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Hear these words. <clears throat> As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Take hold of the life that really is life. I love that phrase. It's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? Of course, the implication is that any other form of life that is not founded on generosity and a desire to be rich in good works or good deeds is a counterfeit life, a, a deceptively fake life that is opposed to the abundant life that Jesus taught. So this is our uh, final week in our series on uncommon generosity. And uh, today is what we call Harvest Sunday, the Sunday just before Thanksgiving. Um, it is a, a time to give thanks. So I read a, a study done uh, just before Thanksgiving a few years ago. It was by the Templeton Foundation. And they found, quote, those who give thanks daily give away 47% more money than those who do not. I found that fascinatingly interesting. Uh, those who give thanks daily give away 47% more money than those who do not. Now, I have no idea how, they, how this study was done, what the parameters were, or anything about that. But it, it does make sense to me, at least, that those who are thankful share in their thankfulness. Those who uh, have greater gratitude share with greater generosity. As we talked about in the first week um, of the series, that our basic orientation of life should be one of gratitude. Uh, the two most important words that we can say every single day is, thank you, thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you to God for life itself, right? Thank you for the food we eat. Thank you for the air we breathe. Thank you for life. And we also know that there is a connection between gratitude and generosity. So I, I want to look back at, at Paul's second letter to Corinth that was read earlier. Uh, remember, now Paul is, <clears throat> let me remind you, Paul's going around, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> ah, okay, I'm, I'm better now. Uh, Paul's going around <clears throat> to the Greco-Roman churches, the churches that he helped to start, and he is uh, collecting an offering. And uh, the offering is that he wants to take back then to Jerusalem um, to the Jewish Christians. So he wants to show that the Greek and Roman Christians are helping to support the Jewish Christians. Remember, there was a famine uh, going on in the land in the 40s and, and early 50s, perhaps two different famines, we're not quite sure. Um, and there's a lot of people uh, in the Jerusalem area that are in need. And they are going through hard times. And Paul is encouraging uh, the Greek and Roman churches to show their generosity. So he writes... Excel in the grace of giving. The full verse reads like this. Now, as you excel in everything, he's buttering them up a little bit, right? As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. He then goes on to say in chapter 9, You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving 
to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. So generosity leads to thanksgiving. And being thankful leads to generosity. That's the way it works. Kind of cool, huh? And when we lead thankful and generous lives, I think we find more joy. It kind of comes on the back end. We take hold of the life that truly is life. You know, today, someone is making it possible for us to worship here this morning because of their generosity. That someone is you. We have heat this morning. Did you feel it when you came in? Nice and warm and cozy because of your generosity. We, we have lights and sound. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for you. And that's not all. But thanks to generosity of a few folks, we will have a big breakfast this morning. Um, we had this past week a, a Thanksgiving luncheon. We have Wednesday night meals together. We have Bible studies. But also, you may not know that right now, our youth and, and some of our youth and counselors, some of the parents, well, not right now, right now, but soon, I guess, uh, we'll be going down um, this morning to the South Main Mercy Center to, uh, to serve food that they prepared and we'll be donating. One of our life groups, a uh, week before last, packed food for, for Meals on Wheels. After Thanksgiving, another group's going to go to Second Harvest or Golden Harvest or whatever the name of it is now. The warehouse, uh, it was Golden Harvest, and I think they're changing to Second Harvest. Anyway, uh, we're, we're going to pack weekend snack packs uh, for United Way. In January, we're starting the new after-school tutoring ministry in the Fortson Housing Authority community. I, I am so thankful and grateful for all this and the more that you do. We do, I should say. And uh, you know, want to know why I'm thankful? Because in times like this, I would call this uncommon generosity. Uncommon because the most common thing to do during rapidly changing times, and think about coming out of a pandemic and financial and economic and what's going on in the world and our societal changes. And the most common thing to do is to turn inward. The most common uh, thing to do during a period of institutional decline or, or church decline is to, to turn inward, to try to save the institution, save the church, if you will. Church decline in America has been largely documented over the last 20 years or more. For the last 15 years prior to COVID, okay, prior to COVID, 15 years prior to COVID, listen to this, we lost about 1 million millennials a year in the church. Now they are beginning to turn 40 years old, the oldest of the millennial generation, and the generations below them, of course, were losing at even faster rates. The COVID pandemic accelerated the decline. We know this now. Multiple projections had the church at the end, where they had the church at the end of 2027, we will have reached at the end of this year. 2022. Experts say the COVID pandemic has accelerated church decline by five years. <clears throat> so you see, and I hope I don't make somebody too angry by saying this today, but the biggest challenge in the church is not homosexuality. And it is not abortion. And it is not racism. And it is not denominational struggles or fighting. I'm not making light of those things. But they are distractions. Because the biggest challenge 
and the biggest opportunity for the church today is that the average age that now sits in our pews is about 64 years old. That's across America. We have lost a generation or two. So here is why I say that Trinity United Methodist Church has uncommon generosity. Because rather than, than turn inward in such a time as this, I see us looking more outward. And that's exciting. Looking, we're looking into the community. Coming out of this pandemic, we're looking into the community and asking where the needs are and what we can do as a church to help fill the needs. And we're being generous with our resources outside of our building. You know, I think the old adage is true. No one really cares what you know or, or even what you believe until they know that you care, right? No one cares what you know until they know that you care. Through your generosity, this church has contributed thousands of dollars and volunteer hours back into our Anderson community in 2022. And I know that we're set to do that again in 2023. We continue to, to focus on the mission to transform the world by making disciples of Jesus Christ. And of course, we know that great commission that Jesus tells us. Go. He doesn't say stay, you know, gather in your upper room. He says, go. Go and make disciples. And in the United Methodist Church, we, we, our mission is to transform the world by making disciples. And we know that transforming the world begins right here in our own community by making a difference. And when we make a difference in the community, when we're making a difference in people's lives, then they will want to be a part of it. So with generous hearts and with gratitude, we must continue to focus on what we can do and not on what we can't do. We must always choose to love in a world of hate. So Trinity UMC, I want you to hear this. I am thankful for you. And I am grateful for this church. And I pray that you are as well. Paul writes, We are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of the life that really is life. A life founded in generosity and good works because God is a generous and good God. And we are created in God's image. So what I want everyone to do right now is to think. Think about someone that you know. Maybe somebody right here uh, at Trinity that is uncommonly generous. He or she lives a very grateful and generous life. You thinking about them? Got them in your head? Now I want you to think about yourself and where you currently are in your life. Do you excel in the grace of giving? Are you taking hold of of the life that really is life. And I want to end by, by telling, by sharing uh, the story that inspired me, that I thought of uh, when I was thinking about um, someone who lived grateful and, and, and a generous life. This is a, a fellow United Methodist, actually, um, in the state of Kansas. 
It's uh, the Jeff Hansen story. I don't know if anybody has, has heard his story or seen him, heard about him. Jeff was born with a genetic uh, disorder, neurofibromatosis. And he became visually impaired from a brain tumor that developed uh, at the age of 12. I, I think the tumor had been there, but they discovered it, we'll say, at the age of 12. And during his um, chemotherapy and radiation for that tumor, his parents uh, wanted to distract him a little bit. And um, they, they bought him some paint and said, here, why don't you paint some pictures? Uh, you know, take your mind off of the chemo and radiation and everything that was going on with his body. And he developed this passion for painting as well as for philanthropy. He said, quote, he just wanted to give back. So despite his low vision, Jeff began painting note cards and, and selling them at the end of his driveway. So his mom decided that she would do some bake sale and they would set up a tent and they would sell baked goods and, and he would sell his little painted note cards. Well, the note cards gradually transitioned to acrylics on canvas and then this, this self-taught artist uh, developed his style. His heavily uh, textured, boldly colored, signature style. The textures helped him because he couldn't see. Uh, he could see shapes and colors some. And, and that was about it. So he would put these textures on so he could fill it with his fingers. And, and then he would add in the colors uh, into the textures. By age 15, Jeff incorporated his art business, employed his parents as his assistants. Uh, for every painting he sold, he donated one to charity. Jeff began his mission. Listen to what his mission was. His mission was to change the world through art. He made a goal of donating $1 million to charity by the time he was age 20. And he accomplished that and made national headlines when he did. Jeff has featured in People Magazine. He's been on CNN's Impact Your World. He's been on CBS Sunday Morning. He was awarded in 2013 both the Young Philanthropist of the Year and the Young Entrepreneur of the Year. He then set a goal to donate $10 million by age 30. As of 2020, at age 27, Jeff raised more than $7 million for charity and was uh, on track for $10 million by age 30. And then in October of 2020, a brain tumor returned and it quickly took his life. And Jeff believed, here's his quote, every act of kindness helps create kinder communities, more compassionate nations, and a better world for all, even one painting at a time. He said something else that might sound familiar to you. He said, quote, focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. Jeff Hansen was not defined by, you know, the kid who lost his vision to a brain tumor. He became defined by his art, by his philanthropy, by his entrepreneurship. He became defined by his gratitude for life and his generous spirit, which led to this um, contagious smile and overflowing joy. His family writes at the end of his website, which I, I invite you to go to it, is jeffhansenart.com. And you can watch the interviews and, and see that contagious smile and his uh, spirit for life, his generous spirit. But they write this at the end of the website. 
The Hansen family has been deeply touched by the public tributes and many people who have shared the unique ways Jeff's art and story have impacted their lives and altered their trajectory. The family finds great comfort in knowing that Jeff's personal mission to change the world through art was indeed accomplished. Well done, our extraordinary and loving son. Your work here is finished. You know, when I read the scripture for this week, I thought this is what it means. This is what it means when it says, take hold of life that truly is life. Live with, with generous hearts and with gratitude. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. As we come to the table, I... Uh, always like to say that this isn't a United Methodist table. This is God's table. This is the Lord's table. And all who claim Christ are invited to come and, and receive God's grace in what is uh, what, what we are doing as a, a little cup of, of juice and bread. Uh, folks will be holding the baskets. It's your time to, to be in prayer, to confess your sins before God. And whenever you are ready to come and receive those elements, return to your seats and we'll, we'll take together. Let's be in prayer. Jesus.
generous God. Generous God uh, provided bread in the wilderness, manna from heaven. And from that time on, bread became a symbol for God's providence, for God's love, for God's grace. Supplied daily. And then God sent Jesus incarnate among us who took bread on the night before he met with death and blessed it and broke it and said take and eat this is my body broken and given for you when the supper was over Jesus took a cup and gave God thanks and passed it around to each of his disciples and said, take and drink. This is the cup of blessing. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is my life, my love, my all. Generously given for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, remember me. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we do remember these mighty acts of Jesus Christ. We remember uh, God's grace and love. God's providence. God's uh, supplying our needs each and every day. We remember uh, Christ's love as he gave himself up for us. And we pray, O oh God, that now we can be the, the body of Christ redeemed by your great love to a world that so desperately needs it. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and, and on these gifts of bread and cup Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we are now called to be the body of Christ redeemed by your great love. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. The bread of life, broken and given, take and eat and remember. The cup of grace, generously given, take and drink and remember. As we continue, O oh God, to, to be in an attitude of prayer, as we are praying continuously, praying that, uh, that your love fills us. We have been blessed by you so that we can be a blessing. So send us forth into this community, into the world. In your holy name, amen. You guys can stand and join in worship with us as we close this morning.
Man. I uh, pray that this was a meaningful time of worship for you today. And uh, make sure that you welcome our new members. Uh, thanks for being a part of Trinity. And remember, I hope uh, everyone will come to the breakfast in the gym. I'm going to have a short prayer for the food. And then we'll join in our benediction. So let's pray together. God, we are so thankful for the servant leaders today that, that cooked our food and, and who will be serving us today. Thank you for the farms and the fields in which the food came. Thank you for supplying our needs. Um, bless our time. Uh, may the food nourish our bodies as you nourish our souls, O oh Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you the grace and the measures of yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Go in peace.